Okay, friends, welcome back. And today we're covering all of chapter 35 and actually crossing over into the first verse of 36. And the talk I've given for today's message, for today's study of this passage, is building something God's way. Now, it would not come as any surprise to most of you who are listening to this, I'm sure, to say that when churches build buildings, they need to raise money. And when churches have buildings, they need to raise money to maintain buildings. Now, having been involved in and with local churches all of my life, including roles in paid ministry, I've been part of some very intensive fundraising activities. I've been involved as a pastor of a church and as a member of trustees and as a deacon of a church in this sort of situation many times. Now, having gone through that in the real world, I can't help but ask when I come to a passage as this is, how would the Lord do this? If the Lord were going to build a building, how would he go about raising the funds and the resources to do that? Well, one answer to that, I believe, can be found in the book of Exodus in chapter 35, where we see God wanting to build a place of worship and how he raises the money and resources to do it. So maybe it would be good to know the way God raised money on this occasion to build this building, if you like. Now, maybe for some of you that might not sound really interesting. However, I do believe that it has an application for us in the everyday life that carries over into other things in terms of our general service of the Lord. And that's really what I'm after today. Now, if you've been with me so far as we've been going through this book, uh, passage by passage, you remember that way back in chapter 25, we had introduced to us the idea, the concept of the tabernacle, or God introduces it really. And that idea was a sort of the revealing of a blueprint, and it was actually disclosed over quite a long series of chapters. We ran through it day by day. It actually goes from chapter 25 pretty much all the way to the end of, of the book in chapter 40. In other words, it's the whole final part, the whole closing section of nearly a third of the book. It deals with this thing called the tabernacle. Now, in the very early chapters of this part of the book, chapters 25 through 31, we see God give Moses the instruction for building this thing called the tabernacle. And that's a bit like today, giving an architect a blueprint and saying, here's the design of what I want, something I want to be built. And in those chapters, it deals with just pretty much the structure and the blueprint of the building. After some serious hiccups, though, along the way, we see that God has to adjust things in response to the people's sin and rebellion involving the placement of this building, all revolving around God's change of perspective slightly following this incident, revolving around a golden calf, you may remember it, where he revises the plans for the tabernacle, this building, so to speak, that he wants to build. Now, there's a lot of similarity between those early chapters prior to the rebellion and the chapters that follow, which deal with some of the technical issues. But what we're going to see in these closing chapters is God revealing and dealing with some of the technical issues around the fundraising and the construction itself. Now there appears to be and in truth there is quite a lot of repetition in these passages. However I would say that it's not needless repetition because the reinstatement in these later closing chapters from 35 to 40 which is the end of the book in fact two great new truths revealed and stressed in some detail. Number one being that this is done in the light of the faithfulness of God to dwell with his people and be with them in spite of their failures and disobedience, both in the past and into the future. And number two, the importance of the obedience of Moses and the people in carrying out God's instructions to the letter. So it seems on the surface that there's a lot of repetition in these chapters of what was said the first time round. But at the same time, there is a very different emphasis because this time it's all done in the light of their failure and their disobedience. The events that were sandwiched between, if you like, these two sections of the disclosure of the building program which of course highlights the faithfulness of God in returning to the plan again. So that's a bit of a background. So today, as I said, we're picking up and starting in chapter 
35. And the passage is seen to open and we'll see God give Moses some instruction on what he wants done. And the initial part of this chapter will actually focus on the fundraising. Then the second part of this passage will show, describe for us the collection of the money in church parlance. They're going to take in an offering, if you like, a special offering. And then in the third part of the passage is they go to work and actually build the tabernacle themselves. And we'll look at how that service is initiated, the spirit in which it's done and who's involved in it. Now, some of the stuff we're looking at is incredibly sort of straightforward. And people who know a bit about the Bible, in terms of what it's teaching, is probably pretty elementary, factually narrative-based. But let's just review what God does when he again plans to build his tabernacle. And it starts in verse 1 of 35, and this is the initial call and the instructions. It says, Then Moses gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together and said to them, These are the words which the Lord has commanded you to do. Now, when it says these are the words which the Lord has commanded you to do, we can take note that the book of Exodus has been full of commandments so far. It started in chapter 20 with those very famous Ten Commandments. But when he says these are the words the Lord has commanded you to do, it's obvious that it's referring to everything that followed on from those initial commandments and particularly referring to the construction of the tabernacle, that detailed information revealed in those earlier chapters up to the point of the rebellion. Okay, the text continues in verse 2. Work shall be done for six days, but on the seventh day it shall be a holy day for the Sabbath, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire throughout your dwellings on the Sabbath day. So in this opening section, this opening salvo, so to speak, which actually this opening section will go all the way down to verse 19. He gives some instructions, but it's important to note, and his first instruction is do not work on the Sabbath, which of course ties in with one of the initial Ten Commandments. You can work for six days, he says, but you can't work on the Sabbath. Now keep in mind that the work they're doing here is building the house of God. So God won't even work on his house on the Sabbath. He wants them to rest and observe the Sabbath. The other interesting thing is in verse 3, it says, you shall not kindle a fire. You can't even light a fire, he's saying. So if, if you think about that, he says, you shouldn't light a fire throughout your dwellings. Now, that's important. So this is drawing attention to the fact that they can't light a fire in their houses. And the question is, well, why would people be lighting fires in their houses? Well, very simply, it's drawing to attention to the fact that they shouldn't cook on the Sabbath. They can't even prepare food on the Sabbath. They've got to prepare their meals on a Friday night and then use what was previously prepared to sustain them on the Sabbath. So the big point here that's been reiterated is that the Sabbath remains and you shall not work on the Sabbath in any way, even building the house of God itself. Now, I told you there are several sections to this whole closing chapter of the book of Exodus. In 25 to 31, we had the initial blueprint and inf instructions given. Then there was an interval where these tragic events occurred and a bit more narrative of the story revealed. And now then verse 35 to 40, we have the re-giving of the instructions for the tabernacle post those rebellion events. Now, the re-giving of them on the surface appears to have a lot of repetition. But this now is given in the light that Israel have demonstrated a definite tendency to disobey. If the covenant is to be maintained, instructions that are to be given have got to be obeyed. And he's saying it's important that even in and among the people's excitement in the construction of the tabernacle to follow, it's important that the worship life and the obedience to God's commandments and ordinances should not be neglected, even by doing work. He wants to remind them to continue to set aside a day, even if you're working on the place of worship. So the thing does not become the end in itself. The importance is to continue the relationship of worship before the Lord. But now he's going to raise the money, and this is what it's going to take to build the tabernacle so we pick it up in verse 4. And Moses spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded, saying, Take from among you an offering to the Lord. Whoever has a willing heart, let him bring it as an offering to the Lord. Gold, silver, and bronze, 
blue, purple and scarlet thread, fine linen and goat's hair, ram skinned, dyed red badger skins and acacia wood, oil for the light and spices for the anointing oil for the sweets and incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. So he's going to receive money and materials to build the tabernacle, but they are to do it with a willing heart. By the way, tithing has not been introduced yet, but this is way beyond that, he's saying. We're in a special buildings program. Today, what they would call a capital investment program. And he says, but I want you to do it with a willing heart. But these materials were to be given voluntarily. This is not a law. This is not a command to give a specific amount. This is not a tithing situation. This is a free will offering, the giving with a willing heart, a case of voluntarily giving. So the first command was to not work on the Saturday, on the Sabbath. And the second command is that the giving in this matter, this project has got to be done with a willing heart. And then the third commandment is actually to build the structure of this tabernacle, to build this thing itself. And here in verse 10, it says this, all who are gifted artisans among you shall come and make all that the Lord has commanded. The tabernacle, its tents, its covering, its clasps, its boards, its bars, its pillars and its sockets, the ark and its poles, with the mercy seat and the veil of the covering, the table and its poles and all its utensils and the showbread. Also the lampstand for the light, its utensils, its lamps and the oil for the light, the incense altar, its poles, the anointing oil, the sweet incense, the screen for the door at the entrance of the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offering with its bronze grating, its poles, all its utensils and the laver and its base, the hangings of the court, its pillars, their sockets and the screens for the gate of the court, the pegs of the tabernacle, the pegs of the court and their cords, the garments of ministry for ministering in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments for his sons to minister also as priests. Now remember, we've been all through this in chapters 25 to 31 and here it's very succinctly summarized for us again in these verses. Now, I did tell you there'd be some repetition in this passage, but the point is that he's listing out everything again. And he said, in order to bring this about, we're going to facilitate that through free will offering. That will include not just the financial resources, but the people's labor, the skills of the artisans. All these things are going to be brought in and utilized in the making, the creating of this place called the tabernacle every part of it, including all those things that need to be made, garments, precious oils, and materials. So Moses calls for workers, all the skilled workers among the people, to make these various furnishings, utensils, and even clothing. But again, I think the significant thing here is that they're all to be brought and to be done and to be created willingly, voluntarily. So that they, in a sense, are coming together as a community to build the tabernacle together. And everyone is invited to contribute their skills or material to it, but only with a willing heart. That's the great underpinning here. From a New Testament perspective, we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. So let each one of us give in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, that's a fascinating verse on many levels. What is the standard by which we are now called to give? I actually think that tithing is conspicuous in its absence in the, the discussion of the epistles of the New Testament, which after all were, were dealing and addressing and referring to the running of local churches in the New Testament times. You will look hard and long to find any information about it. In fact, the only time tithing is mentioned in all of the New Testament is when it's talked about the tithing of the Pharisees. Tithing was a Mosaic law, and I personally don't see it repeated in the New Testament. I think the call of God upon the resources of the people, in a sense, is if you think that's good news to you and you're getting off the hook, is a call for much more in terms of the nature of our giving. But not in a legalistic, statistical way, but in the purpose and the motivation for giving. As a matter of fact, one might say the New Testament standard for giving here is given in verse 7 
as you purpose it in your heart. That's the standard for giving in the New Testament, not a set percentage in my estimation. It's as, it says here, as you purpose in your heart. Now, before you make that purpose or decision, let you remind you of what it also said as a caveat to that principle. It says, uh, almost as a warning, but I say he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So Paul is saying, yes, the standard is now to give willingly, generously, and regularly, but you should give what you know what you believe, but actually what you know in your heart God is calling you to do. And let me remind you that when thinking about this, he says that if you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. But if you give generously and bountifully, then you're going to reap bountifully. But this much I am certain, whatever you give must be done willingly. It must be done, as verse 7 says, with purpose in your heart. So friends, don't give grudgingly or out of compulsion, but do it willingly, generously, happily. I personally don't like pressure being put on people to give. I think that's kind of contrary to everything the scripture teaches in the New Testament and Jesus' drive against legalistic, pharisaic attitude towards. I think what the Lord really likes is just people who give generously, cheerfully, from a willing heart. And that's what Moses is seen to insist here. They're going to build God's house, and if they're going to do it successfully and according to its plans, part of that plan revealed by God is that it is done with the right attitude, a willingness of heart. It's revealed here, and the New Testament echoes and confirms that. God doesn't want anyone to give because they feel under pressure or because someone or a religious organization tells you you're obligated. He wants you to give in response to what he has given you, which should be done happily and, of course, generously because God has been generous and bountiful in his love and relationship with you. And that's how you should give back. Got it? Let's get back to Exodus 35 and pick up where we left off. Uh, verse 20. And all the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. Then everyone came whose heart was stirred, and everyone whose spirit was willing. And they brought the Lord's offering for the work of the tabernacle of meeting, for all its service and the holy garments. The use of the free is then everyone whose heart came willing and was stirred, and everyone whose spirit was willing, again emphasizes that what God really wants here is a free will offering. That is what it will take the tabernacle to be built and that's what it appears the people do i think this is the main emphasis of the passage that they brought the lord's design to fruition by a free will offering taken in terms of people offering their resources not just their financial resources their skills and abilities in the shared work of the building of this thing called the tabernacle verse 22 says they came both men and women as many as had a willing heart, and they brought earrings and nose rings, rings and necklaces, all jewellery of gold, that is every man who made an offering of gold to the Lord. Now that's the King James Version I've just read for you. The New English Standard Version simply says brooches, earrings, signet rings and amulets. So my conclusion is, forget the individual items. It's saying, bring whatever you have, whatever you want to bring. But if you bring it again, make sure you bring it with a willing heart. You're doing it from the heart. It then continues, it widens it out. And every man with whom was found blue, purple and scarlet thread, fine linen, goat's hair, red skins of rams and badger skins, they brought them. Everyone who offered an offering of silver or bronze brought the Lord's offering, and everyone with whom was found acacia wood for the work of the service, they brought it. All the women who were gifted artisans spun yarn with their hands and brought what they had spun of blue, purple, and scarlet and fine linen. All the women whose hearts were stirred with wisdom spun yarn of goat's hairs. The rulers, they brought onionic stones and the stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate, and spices and oil for the light were brought. Spices for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense. So look, friends, they not only brought the contents of their jewellery box, it appeared they emptied their wardrobes, their closets as well. They not only brought gold, they brought all types of material things, 
all of which they used and had in their lives. All of these things being brought to be used in the building of the tabernacle. Silver and bronze, even the wood, everything would be used to be built to the tabernacle. Not everyone would have had precious metals, but even the carpenters would bring some of the wood that they worked with, the acacia wood that would be needed. I think the thing you've got to see here is that this passage is not focusing on the resources themselves. It's focusing on the whole wideness of the offering and the willingness of the offering. So this is what I think adds up to a free will offering today. But it emphasizes all the way through, I want you to do this willingly. This is a free will offering, an opportunity for you to bring a gift to the Lord. And I think that's something we need to be reminded of. You know, we need to give regularly. That's a good thing. But when you give regularly, which is the underpinning of the local church community, the danger is always there that that regularity can easily become a thing of routine. So, so don't fall into the trap of allowing your giving to be taken for granted or to become just routine. You need to bear in mind that there should be, should be joyous and it should be willing and it should be spontaneous on occasion in response to specific needs. Now the rest of the passage has to do with the artisans. I'll read the closing passage from verse 30 and it'll cross over into the first verse 36 verse 1. And it says, And Moses said to the children of Israel, The Lord has called by name Bazael, the son of Uri, the son of Hun, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the spirit of wisdom and understanding, in knowledge and all manner of workmanship, to design artistic work and to work in gold, silver and bronze, in cutting jewels for settings, in carving wood and to work in all manner of artistic workmanship. And he has put in his heart the ability to teach in him. And Elobiab, the son of Hashemach of the tribe of Dan, he has filled him with the skill to do all manner of work of the engraver and the designer and the tapestry maker in blue, purple and scarlet thread and fine linen and of the weaver and Baziel and Aholoahab and every gifted artisan in whom the Lord has put wisdom and understanding to know how to do all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary and shall do it according to all that the Lord has commanded who do every work and those who even design the artistic works. So you see what's going on here so far? Everyone's gone to work here. The women have gone to work. The leaders have begun their work. The everyday people have begun doing their job and the artisans, of course, they've also begun to do it. Not only themselves, but training others to do this sort of thing. But what's intriguing about this is it says that God has inspired them to do it and filled them with the spirit and wisdom. Now, I think today some people give and they give financially and they think that's done for me. And other people who maybe resources are limited, they think I will give time and that's done for me. But I think that what's interesting here is the passage emphasizes both of these. So what that tells me is just because you are able to give money doesn't mean you shouldn't give of your time or your talent or your ability also in order to serve God and get his work done and bring his plans to fruition. Everybody ought to bring both into the service of the Lord. The women, the rulers, the people, the ordinary people, as well as those who have special gifts or talents, all can be brought to work and to the benefit of God. They all give here. It's not just the talented and the gifted. It's everybody from the ordinary people all the way up to the top leaders of the people. Including, interestingly, illustrated in some detail, the fact that the woman as well, which would have been unusual for that time. The artisans, including in, in that, the seamstresses alongside the craftsmen. So everyone is involved in the giving of their time and their talent. So the great message here is everyone, all of us, well, to sum it up, we need to be givers because God is a giver. Ultimately, God gave his only son for God so loved the world, etc. So if you're going to be like your father in heaven, you too need to be a giver also. Okay, I want to close today by giving you a little illustrative story, one that evangelists and preachers have used for many years. I don't pretend it's my own, 
but it's a little illustrated picture when it comes to this perspective, the idea of giving. And let's think it's first saw it, it was called The Honeycomb Givers. And I first came across it in a book by a guy called Richard Dorff called Flashes of Truth about 30 years ago. And Dorff said this, there are all kinds of givers, the flint, the sponge and the honeycomb. I wonder if you've heard this before. He says, he continues, to get anything out of the flint people, you must hammer them and then you'll probably only get chips and sparks. To get anything out of the sponge, you must squeeze it and the more you squeeze it, the more you'll get. But neither of these are what God wants us to be and how God wants us to do these things. But Dorf then goes on to say, God recommends that we should be honeycomb givers, people who just overflow with our sweetness. It's true, you see, some folks are stingy, hard as flint when it comes to financial or resources and they're giving thereof. They give nothing away if they can help it. Other people, well, I suppose they're good natures, but they only reel to pressure, and the more they are pressured, the more they give. But in reality, that means they're giving grudgingly, and in reality, they're calling the church to relate to them in a way that isn't God's plan in how we should relate to giving of our resources. But thank God there are still others. There are those amongst us who just simply delight in giving without even being asked. And that, it says, is the kind of giver, what Dorf describes as the honeycomb giver, the cheerful giver, that's the type of giver the Lord loves. He then went on to say, what is true in the area of money also applies, he believes, in the offering of talents and time to the Lord. Ultimately, the greatest blessing that we can give is that our giving is something that is poured out, which is offered in service and is offered without coercion, in other words, poured out, given willingly for the Lord. And what a blessing they are for all of us. It seems when help is needed, when anything is needed, they're always the first to make themselves available. And those are, I think, the honeycomb givers. And there are other people who only respond if there's a call for help or when they're pressured. They are like a sponge and then they're finally, they won't budge unless they're forced to submit or squeezed very hard. That's not God's plan. And then, of course, there are people who are as hard as flint. I wonder which you are. Well, whether we are offering our possessions or our abilities or our time to the Lord, there's no question about the kind of attitude that is most pleasing to him. This passage in Exodus and throughout the New Testament teaches that the Lord loves people who are cheerful givers, honeycomb givers, those who overflow with his love and his glory and the desire to bring his goodness to the benefit of others. Now, I'm not sure I have changed your perspective on the amount you should give to your church in the study of this Exodus chapter 35, but then that was never my plan. But what I do hope is that by spending time looking at this passage, I have changed the spirit in which you give. I wonder if you ever read a passage of the Bible and think, well, that was a bit boring, maybe, or that was a bit, don't really see the point of that. I mean, for example, when we started our time together working through the Bible and began in Genesis some while ago, we very soon came across a long list of names. And I'm sure many of you thought, well, what's this all about? What's the benefit of this? That was the first occurrence of it. And it happened as early as Genesis chapter five. Well, we got past that together. And in fact, we found some benefit in it, I'm sure, if you remember. But as soon as we forged across that stream, if you like, and carried on a bit, we found ourselves back in the flood again, if you'll excuse the metaphor, because we were plunged in Genesis chapter 10 into another long list of names. And this is not going to be the first of those chapters that gives us just a long list of names. In fact, when we get to the book of Numbers, this has chapter after chapter of names, and so does Chronicles as well. I'll leave it there, because I'm not, I don't think I'm really selling this very well, am I? But we will see and meet chapters which on the surface can appear to be quite challenging and not sure what the meaning is. Some would even accuse them of just being plain boring portions of scripture.
Well, I have to admit that the passage we're going to look at today perhaps rivals those types of chapters. So although it may have some interest in terms of reading some detailed applications that God says are needed in the preparation of the tabernacle, I'm sure for some of you, upon first glance, it's kind of like looking at the terms and conditions of your smartphone. I'm semi-serious here. But on the other hand, we need to remember that the Bible tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. In fact, and according to Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it actually tells us that all scripture is profitable, so beneficial to us. So we have to take these verses in Timothy seriously, and when we approach this chapter, ask what is it in it that is profitable to us? And that's what I'm going to try and find out for us together as we work our way through Exodus chapter 36. According to the Bible and the writings of people like Paul and others, this passage is profitable. So a question that we need to ask is what is the profit? So to do that, I'm going to begin and I'll begin reading to you from verse 2. And that's because if you remember last time, we covered and went all the way through verse 35 and crossed into verse 36 and ended at the end of verse 136. So today I start at Exodus 36 verse 2, which tells us, Then Moses called Baziel and Elohab, and every gifted artisan in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, and everyone else whose heart was stirred to come and do the work. All right, he's called these two men, and the two of them are named as sort of supervisors. They're going to have oversight of all these gifted workers and artisans who are going to work on this project. And the idea here is that many people are going to work on the tabernacle. And many of these people, well, they're referred to as gifted artisans. But the big point here is that although they have the gifting, they're also people who are willing. Because it actually says the people whose heart was stirred. And that's the key. They were gifted artisans, but they were also people who were willing to be involved in the building of the tabernacle. So the emphasis, I think, in this opening verse is the willingness of people to participate by giving materials and talents and doing their work as an act, expressing their gifting as an act of service to the Lord. So the opening verses simply are describing the workmen. And then we see in verses 3 down to 7, we're given the materials that these people are able to bring into the tabernacle and what they do with them. So verse 3 says, And they received from Moses all the offerings which the children of Israel had brought for the work of service of making the sanctuary. So they continued bringing to him free will offerings every morning. Now, if you listened yesterday when I talked about the previous chapter and the fact that they all gave gifts, the emphasis on the previous chapter was also that they should do it willing. And that is true. But here we see into this chapter, they're still coming and they're still coming every morning and they're still freely giving. And that's fantastic, isn't it? But please note, that at this point, tithing has not been introduced. Tithing was not a requirement at this point under the Old Testament law. So this was absolutely talking about here is what we today, I suppose, would call a free will offering. Interestingly, it tells us, moving on, then all the craftsmen who were doing all the work of the sanctuary came from the work he was doing. And they spoke to Moses saying, the people are bringing much more than is enough for the services of the work, which the Lord has commanded us to do. So look what's happening here. The people are, are bringing more, much more than was needed. Have you heard that right? The people have brought too much in their free will offering. Have you ever heard of such a thing in your life in this day and age? Have you ever been in a church where we were told the offering's too much? I've never seen such a church. But I think it's interesting that that, in a sense, is what's going on here. And it will get more interesting. Listen to the next verses. So the Lord Moses gave a commandment, and they proclaimed it throughout the camp, saying, Neither man nor woman do any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. And the people were restrained from bringing of their materials, because they had sufficient for all the work that needed to be done. Indeed, too much. I suspect you've never ever seen 
a passage like this in scripture or even perhaps even heard about this in your spiritual life in this day. The people here are giving too much and Moses has to instruct them to stop giving. As a matter of fact, I did initially call this episode Stop Giving just as a sort of shock value, but I decided that that probably wasn't the best course of action. But I think it's worth noticing that one of the great criticisms I hear from people who are not believers is that if they on occasion go to church, it seems to them it's always about money. They're always asking for the people's money. Sometimes it's to pay bills. Sometimes it's because there's some building project going on. And I have to be honest and say, I really believe that that's a real put off for visitors or new believers when they go to a church. And what they hear, what they experience is the people at the front talking about and asking for money. My advice would be to anybody in church leadership, by all means, it is important to communicate the needs of the church to the membership of the community. But the morning worship service is not the place to do that. All right, that's the first seven verses which form a sort of introduction to the chapter. And as I mentioned, this chapter is about the construction of the tabernacle. So these opening verses are telling us about all these artisans and all the people bringing the materials. They didn't just bring money. They brought their time, their resources, their giftings and the materials in order to build the structure of the tabernacle and all that surrounded it. Remember in the previous chapter, we saw them bring jewellery and silver and gold and that sort of thing. But now beginning in this verses and carrying through this chapter, what we are seeing is them bringing the beginnings of the actual physical construction of the tabernacle itself. Now I mentioned that all of this we've seen before in terms of its description in chapters 25 to 31. Moses there gave the blueprint, the house plan, if you like, of how this should all happen. And now, at the beginning of chapter 36, in fact, all the way through to chapter 39, we will see the building of the tabernacle itself. Now, you may remember back in the first description, the blueprint that God offered, he started by describing the furniture and how it should be made. Things like the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat and the various pieces of furniture in and around the tabernacle. But let's look at this time and see what he starts with now, picking up at verse 8. Then all the gifted artisans among them worked on the tabernacle, making ten curtains woven of fine linen and out of blue, purple and scarlet thread. With artistic designs of cherubim, they made them. The length of each curtain was 28 cubits, and the width of each curtain 4 cubits. And the cubits were all the same size, and the curtains were all the same size. And he coupled five curtains to one another, and the other five he coupled to one another also. He made loops of blue yarn on the edge of the curtain, and on the selvage of one set likewise he did on the outer edge of the other curtain of the second set. Fifty loops he made on one curtain, and fifty loops were made on the other curtain, and those loops held one curtain to another. And he made fifty clasps of gold, and coupled the curtains one to another with the clasps, that it might be one tabernacle. So what's going on here is really straightforward. They're making a covering that was made in panels, because it was so large, so it was pieced together, and then put together as one piece. And that's just what all those verses add up to. Then picking up again, he made curtains of goat's hair for the tent over the tabernacle and he made 11 curtains. The length of each curtain was 30 cubits and the width of each curtain 4 cubits. And the 11 curtains were the identical same size. They then coupled 5 curtains by themselves and 6 curtains by themselves. And they made 50 loops on the edge of the curtain, that is the outermost of one set, and 50 loops he made on the end of the other curtain of the second set. He made also 50 bronze clasps to couple the tent together that it might be one. So, let's be clear here. These verses are describing a second covering, the same size as the first. The second covering was to be made out of goat's hair. And all, all these verses that I'm reading to you, they're just giving us the details of how they put these large sets of curtains together to form one piece and what is coming down to another covering, a second covering for the roof. Then verse 19, 
describes a third covering. Then they made a covering for the tent of ram skins, dyed red, and then a covering of badger skins above that. So that's the third and fourth covering uh, dealt with. So all we've seen in this passage so far is the detail of how they've made four huge coverings that will go over the top of the tabernacle. Four coverings that will lay one over the top of the other, which will all be placed over the tabernacle themselves. The first would be made out of linen, white linen, which they would see obviously in the internal uh, position. Then the second was goat's hair over that. The third was ram skin dyed red. And the last was badger skin and was probably black or majority black. So this building process, as actually carried out here, starts with the roof. Now, I can't say I've ever seen anybody build the roof of a property first. That's not the way we construct buildings today. In fact, you couldn't really start with the roof because you need something to hold it up. But this, of course, is going to be a sort of substantial, closer to a substantial tent, really. So the roof is cloth and skins. So it is, of course, possible to make those first. Some people ask why they made the roof first as well. The honest answer, you can spiritualize it, but I think it's fair. I'm comfortable in just saying, you know what, I don't really know. But what I do know is the second thing that they put together and built, because that's described in the next verses. Picking up at verse 20. For the tabernacle he made boards of acacia wood standing upright. The length of each board was ten cubits, and the width of each board was a cubit and a half. Each board had two tenons for binding one to the other. Thus he made for all the boards of the tabernacle, and he made boards for the tabernacle, twenty boards for the south side. Forty sockets of silver he made to go under the twenty boards, two sockets under each of the boards for its two tenons. And for the other side of the tabernacle, the north side, he made another 20 boards, and they put 40 sockets of silver, two sockets under each of those boards. For the west side of the tabernacle, he made six boards. He also made two boards for the back and the corners of the tabernacle. And they were coupled at the bottom and coupled together at the top by one ring. Thus he made both of them for two corners. So there were eight boards and their sockets, 16 sockets of silver, two sockets under each of the board. So what's worth noting out of all of that is the fact, I suppose, just I draw attention to the fact that they were made from acacia wood. Now, I need to tell you that at that time, acacia trees flourished in those particularly dry and desert places. And it is a beautiful grained wood. But it is also wood that was virtually indestructible by the standards of that day. This was a very durable piece of wood that they'd chosen to do this with. And the only other thing I would add is that very exact dimensions are again given. There's one more thing in this chapter. He calls it the curtain, or sometimes referred to as the veil. So picking up in verse 31 it says, And he made bars of acacia wood, five for the boards on one side of the tabernacle and five bars for the boards on the other side of the tabernacle and the five bars for the boards of the tabernacle on the far side westward. And he made the middle bar to pass through the boards from one end to the other. He overlaid the boards with gold, made their rings of gold to be holders for the bars and overlaid the bars with gold. And he made a veil of blue and purple and scarlet thread and finely woven linen. It was worked with an artistic design of cherubim. And he made for it four pillars of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold and with their hooks of gold. And he cast four sockets of silver for them. He also made a screen for the tabernacle door of blue, purple and scarlet thread and fine woven linen made by a weaver. And its five pillars with their hooks and he overlaid the capitals and their rings with gold and the five sockets were bronze. He also made a screen for the tabernacle door of blue, purple and scarlet thread, a five woven linen made by a weaver and its five pillars with their hooks and he overlaid their capitals and their rings with gold but the five sockets were made of bronze. So what's being described here is the main structural part of the tabernacle itself, the building itself that is within the tented area. And that is made out of boards held up by bars and sockets. And within it, it will have two rooms. 
There is the holy place, and that is the room with the table of showbread and the lampstand and the altar of incense. And then there's a large curtain called this thing called the veil. Inside there is used to portion off this rectangular building and set aside a smaller part, which is actually square, which is described here, screened by a veil, which divides the larger space in the two rooms into two halves, if you like, although not of equal size. And from one part to the other, there is an entrance through this heavy curtain to go from the holy place into what is actually the holiest of holies. Okay, that's the actual text. So what are we supposed to get out of this? Well, I'll be honest and tell you, I scratched my head at first and I looked and thought, but then very clearly I could see it was actually divided into two parts. And the first part we see and we hear about the bringings of the free will offering, the bringings of the material for the building of the temple, and this unusual situation that Moses had to tell him to stop. And I think you can't help but see that and realise that that's an important point. Now, I don't want to emphasize it too much because I don't want to put you into a situation where you feel you're under pressure to stop giving in case your church leader hears about what I'm teaching and gets a bit stressed about that. But the thing I think all of that draws attention to is the situation that they, as a people, were willing to do this willingly, very willingly. It was said as their heart was stirred, so a great many people's hearts must have indeed been stirred by the Holy Spirit. It mentions the fact that the people's hearts were stirred. They were motivated, excited to do this. So I think this is to be seen as the template for a free will offering. I think that's a totally appropriate application to make of it today in our day and age. But I want to make two applications in this chapter. Now it seems to me that if you compare these instructions, which in one level are almost identical to the instructions given earlier in chapter 25 to 31, the difference only being in the order in which the construction is being done, the important thing is to see that overall they did exactly what they were told to do in a very specific way. So it seems to me that just one of the most obvious lessons in this chapter is that we too maybe ought to follow the example here and do exactly what God tells us to do in our day. But the thing called the tabernacle today that we see being templated and built then doesn't exist today. It's just part of the history of Israel. In fact, the tabernacle doesn't even exist today within modern Judaism. So what is the corresponding of the purpose of the tabernacle in relation to us on our New Testament application of the faith? Does it mean anything for us today in our modern expression of living together as Christians in faith communities and gathering together in buildings of our type in our day? Well, I think it has, but perhaps not in the way you think. Listen to this. This is Jesus speaking. This is, in fact, the last thing he said before he ascended to the Father. This is the last thing he said as he walked on the earth. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. This is the close of the Gospel of Matthew. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now this passage is often called and entitled in many Bibles, the Great Commission. This passage is about us today going to the world and making disciples, telling us to baptize and then teach them. Now what I discovered when I studied this closely is there's only one verb, one command in the passage, and that is to make disciples. The command is, the overall mission is, to make disciples. The three participles that follow on from that are command, in other words how we are to do it, is to go and to baptize and to teach. So the emphasis then is given on how we are to go and make these disciples. 
In fact, Mark 16 adds a little emphasis to the go by saying, go into all the world, using the Greek word go, and preach to them, making disciples. Then telling us, both accounts then telling us that those who respond, you should baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And once they are baptized, you begin the process of teaching them how to observe all things. That, my friend, is the great commission of the church. It's the great commission that you and I are part of. Studying that passage in some detail when we worked through Matthew together, I became aware that it is not just about winning people over. It's not just about evangelism. I really, perhaps for the first time, noted that this is ultimately about discipleship. That was what the instructions were given to the apostles and that's exactly what they did. In fact, we see it portrayed throughout the book of Acts being done in this way. In Acts chapter 2, it's kicked off with Peter preaching the gospel and we're told that the Holy Spirit descended and the people asked, what must we do? And Peter replied, simply repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Now the word used for, being baptised for the remission of sins, in this context does not mean that you're baptised in order to get the remission of sins. It's very clear about saying, because you have heard, because you have believed, because you've now got this salvation already, the way to respond to it is to get baptised. So this passage is very clearly teaching in my estimation is that you do not be baptized for the remission of sins, in other words, to get the remission of sins, but rather that you should be baptized because you have already received the remission of sins, which is why I believe and teach believers' baptism. And if we look at what these people did, the apostles did, in the book of Acts, beginning in Acts 2 and beyond, we see them preach the gospel, baptize converts and then gather those people together into groups into what we would today call churches and they taught them and by the end of the book of acts the word church is actually mentioned for the very first time and it says the lord added to their community the actual translation of the greek word means the lord added to that local church daily as many as would be saved I studied Acts many, many years ago, and through studying it in the light of the Great Commission, I essentially saw that it was all about going and starting communities. And we too are to follow the instructions in exactly that way, I believe. Just exact, as exactly as these people built this tabernacle here in Exodus 36. And the exact way God commissions us to do it is to go, to preach the gospel, to baptize those who respond to it and then bring them together into group settings that they can teach and learn from each other. That's exactly what we see them do throughout the whole book of Acts. Acts chapter 2 is the setting up of it and the rest of the book is just the summary of how they did it. And it goes into some detail, of course. But we see them travel around starting churches, communities. We see them preaching the gospel, baptizing believers, and then bringing people together to teach them. And I think very simply that's what we should be doing exactly in that way still today, just as God told us to do. So my friends, if you want to follow God's exact tabernacle, God's exact plan for building his place of community and dwelling, then we need to follow the instructions diligently today. They did it in their day and their way. We need to do it, which means, and I'm speaking to every one of us, that we all at some level need to be involved in a community of believers within a local church. We cannot follow God's instructions if we live our entire spiritual life in isolation, if we're not involved with working with other people. Now, I know for many people that's difficult nowadays. They've had difficult experiences in local churches, but you still have to endeavour to strive towards doing it in this way because some of the things that we're called to do as Christians we cannot do on our own. We can only do together in community, in church. And that's the big thing I got it out of Exodus 36 today. 
God wants us to win people to Christ, baptize them and put them in the church. Put them in so that they can receive the word of God and be blessed beyond all imagination. Do you know, friends, that we can be blessed beyond our imagination by simply, diligently doing what God tells us to do? I'm sure it was pretty beyond most people's imagination that God could get us to a point where he'd tell his people to stop giving. That seems beyond imagination to me, but it's what God told them to do. And what that tells me, that if we live and choose to live in this way, then we too will be blessed beyond all measure. I sincerely believe If church is being done in God's way in this day, then God will supply that community with everything it needs. They don't have to resort to gimmicks. They don't have to pressure people to give. They can just rely on people's hearts being stirred by the Holy Spirit to give and to serve. And that applies to both communities, churches, and to individuals. If we just do what God tells us to do, I believe the promise here is we will be blessed beyond all measure. So friends, come together, meet with other Christians, begin the process of being discipled. If you're getting anything benefit out of this at all and this time we spend teaching together, then use it and apply it and use what you're learning to encourage other peoples. Everything I, I create here I create an episode notes page and a full transcript is available always for you in the episode notes page on where this is hosted. Now you may not get access it through broadcast platform that you're using. That's because they like to keep everything in house and they don't allow the links to be active links. But if you visit us on the bibleproject.buzzsprout.com, that's where it's hosted and that's where you'll find the links, not only to the teaching notes, but to lots of other ways you can access other free resources from this ministry. So I do hope that you find that helpful. I do hope that you find that it is worth diligently coming together with other people to build a place of peace, to build a tabernacle, a place where the Lord can dwell amongst his people, the place the Lord can live with his people within the church, an expression through a community of faith in that you and I and that we all might together be blessed beyond all measure.